Well, my friends, I'm excited to share a few thoughts with you today. Um, God has been speaking to me. When I say God, if you're for the first time in church, you're like, man, church is weird. Pastor's talking about God speaking. Like, that is so weird. Listen, we believe that God is a personable God. We believe that God is giving us life, the gift of life, and we believe that he is involved in our life. And don't be crazy, crazy enough to label me as a freak, okay? Uh, a crazy guy who believes that God is speaking because I believe that God speaks all the time. He speaks to your heart, on the level of your mind, through people around you, events, situation. But don't, don't be scared. God loves you. God is for you. Amen. Uh, we are in a series of who God is and how knowing of who God is is helping us to grow, mature. And today I want to talk to you something that God is not like us. Uh, oftentimes we talk about God is gracious, we should be gracious, God is good, we should be good, that God is in love with us. All these great things that we can relate to God. However, this one message today especially in a season of Christmas, I want to share with you, you'll be blessed, is how God is not like us, which is, I call it God of timing. Everybody say God of timing. God of timing. Now, I'm going to use this example, and I'll be using a lot. I don't know how much, um, you know, this could be in the middle. And so one, this lets me be, okay, good. Ooh, sometimes with all the musicians in the middle of it, all the cables, that's great. Let's see how far this will go. Ooh, it does. Nice. Awesome. See, when you start rearranging furniture, it's never a good thing. If you're a husband, if you're rearranging furniture in a house, run for your life. That thought was from the devil, okay? That was not the Lord. Okay, I've learned that anytime I move couch even for a few inches because we're playing game with kids while my wife is... Absent, when she comes home, that's the first thing she notices. <laughs> Never says hi to me, no kisses. She comes and she's like, wait. And I knew it. You know, and so it, it is crazy. It is crazy. The first people in the first service earlier today, 9.15, everybody was talking about how to cope with Christmas. Everybody was talking about happy life, happy wife, happy life, and listen to your wife, somebody says. I mean, everything was about fear. Uh, this group of people is a little bit... <laughs> Uh, less, less afraid, and so a little bit more kind of, you know. But uh, I want to talk to you about God of timing. What is the difference between time and timing? Time and timing. One is a noun and one is a verb. We know that. But what is the actually difference between time and timing? Let me shock you. Ready for this? God has never created a time. What? No. God has never created he never made a time it is us the people that we try to figure out who God is and what he has done now we know that he set the seasons into the atmosphere and if we had no seasons we would never have time of sowing and reaping we would never have harvest okay but we watched God we saw God we saw what God decided, what he has made, and we said, oh, let's figure it out. Oh, 60 seconds equals one minute. 60 minutes equals one hour. There are 24 hours. There are seven days. There are 12 months, you know, and then we count the years, and we try to figure out short day, long night, long day, short night. I mean, all these things we're trying to figure out, so we said, let's talk about time, but God is Never about chronos, Greek word, chronological time. He is always about a timing. Now, here's something crazy. A lot of people think that timing is, watch this, timing is an event, like something that will happen at the right time. Therefore, we call it timing. But don't miss it. Timing is not an event. From this event, timing, to this event, this is timing. No, timing is, is, timing is actually a space between the two events. Everybody say a space. space. A space. In fact, I'm going to tell you and I'll suggest for your analyzing and pondering today that most of you are actually living right here. Your thought might be about an event. 
But the reality is right now you're right here. See, I'm going to surprise you. A lot of you are struggling in life because you have created a picture in your mind. A picture of what life should be like. So you say, if I lived like in my picture, that would be a good life. And you never have time for space. You never have time for timing. You always say, oh man, I was expecting this kind of life and it never happened to me. And you never enjoy the now, the moment. And God is calling you to enjoy them. In fact, that is why God never tells you your future. Oof. Let me explain this. If you're writing points, I'm going to make point number one. Ready? Here we go. God often gives you a promise and rarely an exact timing for it. Okay. Let me give you scripture. The scripture for the day today is Luke chapter 2. And we're going to read uh, in New Living Translation. Luke chapter 2, famous passage. Let's go. Say it with me. Say, at that time. At that time. Now, what was the time? The time was, this was the eighth day after Jesus was born. Eighth day. Now, can I just give one minute? Here we go. Jesus. God becoming a human. For your sake, for my sake, for our sake. Jesus, the most important person ever lived. Jesus, the most important event ever existed. Jesus, the focal point of humanity, the focal point of existence. Jesus, that without him, nothing would have been made. Jesus, 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 the truth. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. A day after he was born, he was brought to the temple to fulfill the religious regulation of the day. Then Dr. Luke steps back, going to detail eighth day, the birth and eighth day. He steps back and he says, kind of bigger picture. He says, at that time, at that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous. Righteous means, especially at that time, I'm trying to live according to what I believe in, okay? And devout, devout in a contemporary language would mean somebody who is in love with God, in love with God. So he was trying to live to, according to what he was believing in, and he was in love with God, and he was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come. Now, I want you to understand, and please don't, don't miss it. This was so profound. Because in that day, not many people believed the Messiah's coming. They were too disappointed. They were waiting for too long. But this man was waiting for Messiah to come. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Verse 27. See, 25 was at that time. 27. That day. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple, to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby, next page, as the Lord acquired, Simeon was there. Simeon was there. At that time, on that day, he was there. 25. At that time, 27. On that day, here we go, 28, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. Wow, what a story. Out of this chapter, out of this story, I believe that God wants to speak to you personally. I know a lot of people were blessed. <laughs> I, have, I have had a lot of testimonies after first service, and I know you'll be blessed right now. We're going to talk about God of timing. Now, here's something crazy about God. God never created time. We did. God is the God of timing. And God of timing wants you to live right here. God of timing wants you to live right here. Not the past event. Let me, let me stop for a second. Not in your past. 
and not in your future. He wants you to live right here. Here's how interesting God sees the world. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1. I want you to see this. This is God speaking. There is an appointed time for everything. And there is time for every event under heaven. Timing is God's business. Let me give you one more scripture very quickly. Uh, this is in Message Bible in Acts chapter 1 verse 7. Here we go. Very interesting. Jesus told disciples, you don't get to know the time. Timing is Father's business. You don't get to know the time. Now, why would, why would God not trust us with the knowledge of timing? Here's why. Because we have a tendency, ready for this? Tendency to manipulate people if we know the end of the event. In fact, it would overwhelm us if we, if we know our future. Now, imagine, imagine, imagine. I'm trying to see who I can use as an example. Imagine if you are a young guy and you already, way before you started dating, you already knew you, who you're going to get married for sure. You know what would happen? You would never be you. You would never live the life that you're living right now. You, would, you might be definitely overwhelmed, petrified, scared, doing all kinds of research. You'll be paying to Wikipedia day and night. Like, give me more and more about the person. You'll be hiring private investigators, public investigators. You'll be doing all kinds of research. I mean, imagine how, because we tend to live our life through a mindset. We try to think, think and more think, overthinking things. God does not tell you your future. God does not tell you your future because we control it. We manipulate it. We overthink it. It's too much. It's overwhelming. And more importantly, God only gives you what you can handle. God only gives you what you will appreciate at that moment. I, and this is the best example I could give you right now. And just in one small example. Here we go. How many of you have seen these before? Advent calendar, okay? My wife is a great mom, great mom, the best mom I've ever met in my life. She's phenomenal. Phenomenal mother, I'm telling you. I can testify day and night, okay? Phenomenal mom. I mean, she lives for kids, telling you, okay? And she wants me to do as well, which is like, oh, you know? First she used me to be a mom, and now she wants me. Anyway, okay, that's just so sad, you know? I feel used. I'm Anyway, okay. Kids, you're here. Okay, you can write books about it later. Okay. You were scarred, Mandel? All right. Okay, so here we go. 24 days, Janu uh, De December 1st. Mandel is like, I've heard it all. I've been abused enough. He doesn't even care anymore. Uh, all the way 24. So she bought for a four-year-old. This is four-year-old advent calendar. And then a six-year-old had her own leg of friends. Okay? And then the 13-year-old the and the 17-year-old, they have just a bunch of chocolates, you know, which is crazy. Okay? So the six-year-old on, say it. You didn't get anything? She's still the best mom, okay? And for, and for telling the whole church the truth, you'll be in trouble today. Anyway, I'm joking, guys. This, that's why they're so honest, because nothing happens in this house. Everybody has an opinion. I'm just a servant in the house. In fact, here's an advice for you. You want to get married and be happy? Become a servant. If you're a prince, you'll be a loser, okay? You, 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 you're not ready to get married. Be a servant, because everybody has an opinion in my house, and I love it. And I walked in my house, I was like, before I walked in, I was like, Lord, I'm coming in. Torture. Anyway, and so, okay. That's the truth. Jokes aside. Okay, so my six-year-old, every single day, she has a ritual. I mean, she's already religious. She, you know, breakfast in the morning, and then she opens, she's happy, and she goes with her toy to school. Now, the four-year-old opened on the first day of Christmas. It was usually 12, but this is the, uh, you know, uh, December. He opened it, he saw it, and there is a toy. You open the first day, and there is a toy you can put together, and, you know, the second, December 2nd, my wife and I went on a rare date. And we left the one that never got anything. And his brother, <laughs> that's why he didn't get anything, because I'll explain why. Probably that's the reason. Okay, we actually did, but the 17-year-old is, you know, devoured. So, okay. And, and, and so, you know, he, they stayed home. And what happened is we come home from our date. 
and the four-year-old at 10 p.m., which is surprising, he wasn't sleeping, okay, he comes in, he's like, I didn't do it. Now, when a four-year-old tells you he didn't do it, you know, you know it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, the first part, you know, the confession part, but not the part of lying, you know. I didn't do it. So the confession is Holy Spirit, but the lying part, I didn't do it. And I said, who did it? He's like, Isabella, obviously. You know, Adam says, the woman you gave me. But anyway, and so I didn't do it. I said, what? So anyway, he leads me to a room because it's in that room, but I didn't do it. So then I, I go and I see under the table of this advent calendar, and I opened it and watched this. And this is you and I. This is the day number two, okay? Watch this. The, okay, this is supposed to be like that. I can see him. Okay, I, I don't even have, it's all, you know, it's a guy opening thing. It's, just, it's, it's called, you know, just rip it. Anyway, okay, who cares about packaging? So the first one we open, in fact, miracle, the first is still in, okay? I, don't get me, I don't know how, I think it was moved, okay? The second one, everything is moved. Now, watch this. I said to him, Karis, you opened all of it? He's like, yes, I wanted to see what's coming. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to see all my toys. I said, okay, you saw it now. I said, where are the toys? He's like, I don't know. <laughs> I said, did you like it? He says, kind of. <laughs> now, okay, that, that's fine. Next day, December 30th, Isabella wakes up, has her breakfast before school, opens up, and he's like, where is my calendar? <laughs> see, if God gives you everything, what's coming? Guess what happened? The next day you're bored. The next day you never appreciate what you had. The next day you can't handle. See, there is timing for everything. And God gives you piece by piece. An event by an event. A moment after moment. Why? Because you can only handle that much. See, when we come to pray and we say, God, please give me, we think that the only prayer that our answer is the prayer that God says yes to. But that's a lie. The same God that says yes can also answer no. That's also an answer. No is an answer. Also, not yet is an answer. So when Karis went today, number two, I wish the one that didn't get anything actually said, not yet. Because delaying is not denying. Delaying means you have to wait for your moment, for your season. And there are many things we'll talk about why God is delaying the promise. See, and let me just stand right here for a second. I, I just want to make sure this is where you live. This is where God wants. This is the best place you could ever live wait wait pastor john wait no no i want to live by experiences i want to write my story well, that's not a popular name now the narrative I, this is my narrative okay and because the story is too dangerous okay so i want to but god wants you right here timing space the space between the events see god gives you a promise and you want it to materials right just like that give it to me god promised now now and god says no i'm not going to tell you when I'm not going to tell you when. He might give you a promise when you read the scripture. By the way, I said it first service. I'm going to say it one more time. Some of you never had a promise from the Lord. In fact, most people that I meet as a pastor, they want the word from the Lord. But not many people are willing to pick up the Bible. Don't tell me you are looking for the word from the Lord and not willing to open the Bible. Don't tell me that. The Bible is full of pro over 7,000 promises in those 66 books of the Bible. And the author of the Bible is God himself. How could you tell me that you are looking for the word from the Lord and not willing to open the Bible? Open the Bible. I would say to you that 90 plus percent of your life, God will speak to you through the Bible. And when somebody else comes in and says, I feel like the Lord told me to tell you. Or when you're praying and God is speaking to you. It's going to be confirmation to what you know. To what God has promised you through a scripture. So we have the promise. A lot of us have a promise. Pastor John, God promised 
that my parents will be healed. My dad will be healed. My mom will be healed. My sister will be healed. God promised that my brother will be saved. My sister, my kids will be saved. God promised. And, and, and then we like, where is the promise? When is it going to materialize? When is it going to come to pass? Where is God in my life? And God says, I want you to say it one day at a time. One day at a time. One moment at a time. One day at a time. One day at a time. Write this down, number two. This is very important. I want to talk to you, number two. God will change you. Now, notice I didn't say your life. Isn't it crazy how we all are about changed life? And God wants to change you. Right. Oof. God will change you. You can, you can fill up the gap and say, me and my life. God will change you and your life by a revelation, not by information or education. Young people, those of you are teenagers that are going to college, uh, when you were told that you need to get a piece of paper, four-year degree, six-year degree, that's the most important part of your young life, that's a lie. Piece of paper doesn't mean anything. You don't go to college. Watch this. You don't go to college for a piece of paper. You go to college to become your own person. Let me say it one more time. There's very few people that you will ever meet in your life. They will ask you, what college you went I mean, you can wear it big time. The Oklahoma. The Ohio. Come on. Stanford. You can have, I mean, whatever. You, you, well, but most of the time, I don't care. I care about you as a person. I want to meet the person, not the education that you have. Talk to me about you. I want to be introduced to you. I want to encounter you. Yeah. I want to deal with you, not your education. I don't want to know information that you know. I want to know you because I'm going to be dealing with you as a partner. I'm going to be dealing with you as my confidant. I'm going to be dealing with you as a friend, not the information that you have. Because if you are skewed, then it doesn't matter the information that you know. If you are messed up, it doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter. You're not reliable. You're not trustworthy. So let me say it one more time. When we're sending you to college, in reality, it's not a piece of paper. My seven-year-old is like, yes. GPA doesn't matter. Yes. Yeah, it's about you becoming a man on your own. You becoming a woman on your own. It, it's about you making decision that, wow, there's no mom and dad around. No one's going to help me. This essay, research paper has to be done. It has to be me. I can trick once or twice. I can slide through once. I can blame on being sick or whatever, but it's not going to happen. It's about you. Become, God will change you. You, not by an information, but by revelation. What is revelation? Revelation is God showing more of himself to you. You think the revelation has to do something with, oh, wow, I never knew. Really? Warren Buffett is almost as rich as Bill Gates. Wow, this will change my life. Are you serious right now? One is a software, that one is a real estate. I'm, you know, in real estate, like, how is it possible? I'm surprised. And who, who is the richest man in Europe? Who cares the information? Who, that will not change your life or especially it will not change you. But revelation, knowing of who God is, will change your life. Simeon, Simeon, Simeon. Simeon. He was in love with God, and he says, God, what I believe in you, I'm going to live it out. And God says, hmm, I'm going to bring you into the picture. I'm about to send my son to change the history forever. I'm about to bring my son who for 2,000, sorry, 4,000 years, people were looking towards Jesus. And now for 2,000 years, we're looking back to Jesus. Jesus was the focal point. And when God was about to make it happen, watch this. This is shocking to me. Here we go. 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 There was only two people on the eighth day of Jesus being brought to temple. Two 
people. You know, this gets me every time. I said, God, you sent your son. Galatians 4.4 4 says that at the right time, the appointed time, God sent his son. This was the most important event in the history ever. And yet on the eighth day, when he is in the temple, in the place where God's supposed to be present, there's only two people. Simeon and Hannah. Nobody else. Like, where is the big choirs? Hallelujah. Where's the media? Where's paparazzi? I mean, wh wh where's everybody? Nobody cares. God will bring you into the picture, into an event that he has planned he has carefully, he will bring you into it by revelation as he's changing you. Write this down. Next statement. Here we go. Next statement. Here we go. Come on, what? Okay. God is more interested in who you become than in what you do. Yeah. See, God, Pastor John, can you pray with me? I really want to get a better job because better job will give me more money. God, why not answer? I really, like, ah, man, CFO would be great. Don't want to be CEO. I just want to be with finances, okay? Dealing with finances. C I mean, chief financial officer, that's my calling. Because with money comes a better life. The more money, the better life. No, God is not interested as much in what you do. And so while all your prayers and all about what you do, oh, man. Ah, watch this. Oh, if, if I could marry a guy that, that, that this is what he does for a living, like, whoo, Lord, I want to be identified with this guy, not that guy. What if you looked at the heart? What if you looked at the mindset more than anything? A mindset. You know that you don't live with a person according to what he does, but the person that he is or she is? Why are our prayers so skewed? See, oftentimes we don't see God answering that kind of prayers. You know why? Because it never reflects his heart. He says, wait. But I want it now. He says, wait. I want it now. No. He says, why don't you develop friendship with the girl <laughs> or with the guy? Why do you want to jump into bed so quickly? not the right time sexual intercourse is a crescendo relationship it's not the beginning you will never enjoy intimacy if you're not friends okay on a first night first day go for it then then what else what else you never know the person you're sleeping with because you don't care You might love, quote, the body, but do you love the scars of a person? Did you even get to know the person? God says, wait. God says, wait. Why? Because I do care for your partner. I do care for her heart. I do care for what she is going through. I do care for him. I do care. I listen to his prayers. Wait. Get to know one another. Wait. God. Okay. I messed up there, but could you, could you just bless me? Could you just give me this? I, I really want to do it. And God says, no, I'm interested in what you're becoming. God will let you stay here in between as long as you have to. To change you. You know how easy it is for God to give you whatever he promised you? Uh, Vlad, can you throw us Isaiah chapter 60? Watch this. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 22, B in NLT. At the right time, I, the Lord, will make it happen. You realize that God created a universe with one statement, one word. He says, let there be light. Boom, happen. Now, we're dealing with God of immediately, quick. 
Boom, shakalaka. Let's like this. Bam, happen, happen, happen. That's it. And why do I have to live in between when God can just say a word and it will have? Why? Because he's interested in who I'm becoming. Because he's dealing with your character. In fact, the best way to grow your character is in a challenging time. Is in a challenge. And you want to escape. Oh, man, it's uncomfortable. That's where you develop your character. When you are squeezed, you make sure something pleasant is coming out of you. <laughs> See what I'm saying? When you are in constraint, something pleasant. There is not like, oh, man, I... Effing out the French, Spanish, English, a little bit, and mostly foreign languages coming out. And your kids are like, woohoo, wow. Don't you ever speak like that. God is waiting until in a challenging time you say, Lord, I don't understand, but I'm going to trust you. Point number three, please write it down. God is more interested in your faith than your achievement. Yeah. See, I see all of these principles in the life of Simeon. I just didn't want to go in verse to verse and, and, and you know, correlate. Your faith, this is so profound. This is so profound. In fact, where's, the, where's my advent calendar? Um, my four-year-old is all about a toy. It's all about a chocolate. It's all about things. He doesn't understand that I work very hard for him to notice me, for him to trust me. Because if it's up to him, he opens all of it. Why? Because he doesn't understand that tomorrow another toy will be here. Why? I made sure I bought the right calendar. And if something happened that is above his age or whatever, I'll go to the store and buy him something else. Because it's about me. It's about trusting me. Listen to me, everybody. It's about trusting God. It's about trusting God. God will do whatever he has to do. He will keep you at the same spot for a long time until you say, God, I have nothing to brag about. I have nothing to brag about. But I'm going to trust you. I have nothing to run on. I, I, I have no, I, I, I don't even know what to tell you. I'm, I'm done. I used to think that I am somebody. I am something. And I realized that this something and somebody, I, I can't even provide for myself. And yet alone I have all these visions and dreams and aspirations and so on. I'm just going to trust you. And he says, good. That's where we should have started. God will let you wait and wait and wait. And you think, oh, he's slow. And you think, oh, he doesn't hear me. And you think, oh, he failed me. And he says, no, I didn't. I'm developing your character and I'm growing your faith. God says, I'm developing your character and I'm growing your faith. God says, I'm developing your Imagine. In fact, can I just talk to you just a little bit about your faith? And this might shock you. You realize that this man, one of two that was there on that day, the eighth day, one of two. Imagine the world, the world full of people that need a Savior. Now the Savior has arrived. He is on the scene. And there are only two people that ever allowed the scene. One of them is Simeon that we're talking about. And this guy, Simeon, we don't know anything about his wife. We don't know anything about his parents. Parents. We don't know where he came from. We don't know about his kids, grandkids. Maybe ask him, like, Grandpa, great grandpa, when are you going to die? I don't know. He's just old, but you're still killing me on, uh, you know, 40 yard, yard dash. I don't know. You're just crazy. Uh, they don't know that God promised him something and he's enabling him to live this life until the Messiah shows up. They don't know any of that. We don't know any. Why? Because God deals with a person of faith. See, sometimes you're so crazy about your family, like, God, I want my wife, I want my husband, I want my brother, my sister, I want my kids, I want my, 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 my son, my daughter in, in the picture. But God says, I want to grow their faith. So he deals with you. And while I, I, I like your heart that you're all about including everybody, but you realize that you cannot do anything about anybody until their faith started growing. If you bless somebody, it will be like, a, oh, nice of you. Thank you. But you don't want to be a blesser. You want God to be a blesser. You want them to see that God blessed them through you. 
God bless them. And you're just, you just a tool. Because if you become a source, oh, oh, I feel sorry for you. If you die and you were a source, your kids will be in poverty. You don't want to be the source. You want God to be their source. So don't train your kids to think that you are the source. You are not a source. Don't train your wife to think that you are the source. You are not the source. Don't train your husband to think that you are, the, you are not the source. God is. But he's dealing with Simeon, who we don't know anything about his surrounding, for one reason only. Because that is the man that is growing his faith. That is the man that says, God, if you promised that I will see the Messiah... I am totally fine. I am fine living in a timing. I am fine being in the space. I am fine to grow my faith. I am fine to grind it out. I'm fine. And this morning, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to value your faith above everything you are going through in your life. This morning, I want to challenge you to hold on to your faith in God because that is the most precious commodity. That is the, the highest value you have in your life. Why? Because if you trust him, he is always going to be there for you. If you, try, if you say, God, I'm just going to rely on you. I'm going to throw myself on you. I mean, things make no sense. Okay? As circumstances, I'm confused. But I'm going to trust you. I am going to trust you. Our 17-year-old was a little boy. He was four-year-old. And we were, my wife once took us to see the tulips somewhere in, up north. I don't even remember. I decided to forget the place. Okay. And we went far. And we went places where it was just nothing but mud. I don't know what we were looking for. I was getting something. And four-year-old was with me, and we got stuck in the mud, okay? And then he says, like, Dad, can I get on your shoulders? I said, absolutely. So I got him in. I went to the point that I realized that I'm losing my shoes, okay, in the mud. Because we were going, I mean, we were being silly, stupid, you name it. And, and, and as I'm, I'm just like, I'm about to leave it there and just walk barefoot all over and get in the car somehow, you know. And my four-year-old, Johnny, at that point, he said, he's on my shoulder. I'm holding it. And he's like... Dad, come on, I know you can do it. I trust you. I'm just like, great. I'm great, you know, very good. I mean, I, I would have been easier if you walked next to me. I would pull you. But on me, it's like a little bit more difficult. You know, the kid enjoyed food like, you know, like his father. So he was, you know. Anyway, and so, bless his heart. And, and, and so, it, it, but, but, but the best thing that could ever happen to him was the fact that he relied on me. See, he didn't care. He wasn't working. He wasn't trying to pull his leg. He wasn't trying to save the boots, okay? Because I thought I ma married my wife for money and there was no money. She tricked me. And so I was like, you know, I was like, okay, if I lose his boots, I'll be barefoot for a long, you know. But, but, but the truth is he, he relied on me. And for him, it was it. That was easy. All he had to learn is just say, Dad, I know you can do it. I'd never forget that day. I've lost one shoe there anyway. I don't like tulips up to today. I still don't buy them. <laughs> I don't go to Netherlands. I, I don't like tulips. Okay? Holland. Forget it. Okay? I don't go anywhere. Okay, so I'm just trying to say right now is, is if you could learn to trust God. Trust God. Then this space wouldn't be that hard. It, it wouldn't be a waiting room on my way to a dentist. You won't see God as a dad, oh, about to be pulled out. Woo! <sighs> Two days after, wow, it's going to be tough. The waiting room wouldn't be like, oh, is it going to be cancer? No, that's not a waiting, re waiting room you will be in. It will be like, I'm okay to enjoy the day. God will come to pass. God will mat materialize what he has promised. The word that was spoken by God will become a surface. A foundation, hard surface, tangible. I want to encourage you as we're going to pray right now. I want to encourage you. Because Simeon was at that time in love with God.
The Spirit of God says, listen, today is the day. Go to the temple. Watch this. His faith was so strong that listen to the words that he said. I want you all to look at me. The biggest test of where your faith is at is this. Tell me, is there joy in your life? Are you happy? Are you content? And are you living in peace? Peace and joy are the two principles that will always define whether your faith is strong. Don't ever generalize your faith. Oh, I think my faith is strong. Pastor John, like, yeah, I'm a woman of faith. I'm a person of faith. What does it even mean? What the, the heck does that even mean? Here's what it means. Tell me, are you happy? Tell me, are you at peace? Tell me, tell me, where's your heart when you're falling asleep? Tell me, what are you like when you wake up in the morning? Tell me, what's the way? What's the prism that you wake up through? What's the, what's the glasses that you're wearing in the morning? Because if it's not joy and peace, I don't know about your faith. I don't know about your faith. Because faith says, I don't see it, but God is faithful. Faith says, hey, I don't see it, but he's coming through. Believing God is believing him. It doesn't matter when, that he never told me when. I trust him. I'm not relying on the future event. I'm trusting him. I want you to take a moment right now. Take a moment. I want to ask everybody, I want to ask you, we just have two pianos, that's fine. Just two pianos, is fine. Everybody just remain sitting, please. Please don't move. Let's respect everybody's privacy. I want you all to just for a moment, <laughs> close your eyes just for one minute.